fastest sport on Earth. 500 miles an hour, 50 feet off the deck with your hair on fire. And the first circumnavigation of the globe. We really entered the books of aviation history by doing this flight. <laughs> it's fabulous. To the groundbreaking accomplishments of the Jetman. You are about 130 miles per hour, but you don't feel you are falling. You are flying. It takes ingenuity, revolutionary technologies, and a passion for risk to conquer air and space. Risk-taking is part of our DNA. The character and vision found time after time at Breitling. Masters of the Pilot's Watch. Designing and crafting the perfect watch is a challenge for the ages. But creating a watch for those who push the boundaries of flight is an aspiration beyond all others that for 130 years has been in the spirit and soul of only Breitling. It's about going faster. It's about really removing obstacles and finding new solutions. Eighteen eighty four, the dawn of the age of flight. Otto Lilienthal, known as the father of aviation, is dreaming of bird like gliders that will inspire countless aviators, including the Wright brothers. And Leon Breitling creates a company specializing in timers and chronographs. The link between Breitling and aviation started very early. The first aviators very quickly used these chronographs and counters. They needed them to measure flight times, to master their flight times. While these early aviators soar to new heights, Leon Breitling continues perfecting his timepieces. In 1896, he introduces two chronographs. They're marketed as the only true and correct time system with a reset function known as instant jump, an essential part of what we now call a stopwatch. Within 10 years, the company produces 100,000 timers and chronographs. A decade later, when Leon's son Gaston takes over, he becomes interested in the growing popularity of wristwatches. Gaston creates the first wrist chronograph, but with an added innovation. Previously, the crown controlled the stop, start, and reset functions. Gaston's revolutionary idea is to add a push piece separate from the crown to operate the stopwatch functions. It's ideal for pilots. When you think about early aviators, there was no electronic back then. The only instruments uh, these guys had were basically the watch. When you would have to go from point A to point B, how do you know where you are? Gaston Breitling, he understood that if you want to do some start, stop and restart, you need another uh, way to activate the, the chronograph. A few years later, Gaston refines his invention. The separate push piece now controls the start and stop functions, while the crown resets the instrument. Pilots now can perform several consecutive timing operations in a row without having to ever reset the hands. From that moment on, people could start, stop, start, stop, start, stop, and then they reset it, and after, they had the total time. A decade later, Gaston's son, Willie Breitling, pushes chronographs even further with the invention of the second independent push piece. With this innovation, the first push piece controls the start and stop, and the second independent push piece controls the reset. 
That was really a breakthrough in terms of functionality, brightening, defined today's configuration of the Crown Graph. Today, that push piece technology is worn worldwide by fighter pilots, aerobats, commercial pilots, and even by daredevils of the world's fastest and perhaps most dangerous motorsport. The Reno Air Races. Supercharged, modernized World War II aircraft are competing in the unlimited class. And Breitling's Tom Richard is there. Most people would say that uh, you have to be passionate about it. I argue that it's probably a little bit more like fanaticism. If you don't live, eat, and breathe it, you're simply not going to be successful. It's that hard. In this six-lap race, pilots and planes cover nearly 50 miles in eight minutes at speeds averaging 500 miles per hour sometimes cruising as low as 50 feet off the ground. It's racing taken to the most extreme. Flying is risky. We elevate that risk by going fast, by pushing engines, by pushing airframes. If people weren't willing to take risks, you know, we'd probably be still be racing on foot. This is the ultimate uh, expression of freedom uh, in aviation. As pilots maneuver pylons to make each turn, the G-forces, the stresses on both the pilot and his technology, are immense. Come around the pylons and uh, we pull about four and a half to five Gs in the turn. So it feels about like an elephant sitting on your chest. And even the smallest mistake or technical failure can mean disaster. I tell people often that you should not be afraid of dying. You should be afraid of not living. Tom Richard and Breitling taking risks, flying high. Winners in aviation. Fearlessness in leadership and aviation technology is truly in Breitling's DNA. And no one represents that character better than Breitling's third generation leader, Willie Breitling. A man who took great risks in the name of his beliefs and his company. Willie Breitling was probably the most interesting character that the Swiss watch industry has ever known. Really a prototype of the risk taker in everything he did in his life. 1940. Willie Breitling has been running the family business with great success for eight years. He's the one who managed to make all these chronographs for airplane dashboards. Some of his newest products include specialized instruments for aircraft cockpits. Britain's Royal Air Force, the RAF, is one of their first and most enthusiastic customers. They use Breitling's finest in their high-flying fighter planes. That was a huge uh, demand from the Royal Air Force to fit these cockpits with cockpit clocks. Breitling was the official supplier for these kind of instruments on the dashboard of these uh, warbirds. But as World War II descends on Europe, Willie Breitling and his company's relationship with the Royal Air Force puts Breitling in jeopardy. Germany is expanding everywhere. Breitling is aiding an enemy of the Nazis. The Germans could swoop across the border at any moment. How do you deliver watches to Britain at a time when Switzerland is totally surrounded by uh, Nazi Germany? But Willie has a plan, a risky one, that he hopes will get Breitling cockpit clocks to the Allies without being discovered. Late at night, in a remote mountain meadow, he waits. At a prearranged time, a secret RAF flight circles and touches down.
Ignoring the risks, Willie loads on board hundreds of new and vital aviation instruments, successfully resupplying the Allies. But now comes his real challenge, how to cover his tracks. Willie Brightling was very courageous, really putting his life on the line. Immediately he would drive very fast to the next city, going to the bar, act like he got drunk, going to a fight, get arrested by the police, to have the perfect alibi. Throughout the war, Willie made many similar deliveries. He was never caught. Willie Breitling, a courageous leader, perhaps Breitling's ultimate risk taker. From Breitling's aerobatic jet team, to its high-flying acrobatic wing walkers. Risk-taking is in the blood. But no one may better represent the Breitling spirit of aviation skill, technical innovation, and courage than Breitling's own Jetman. An aviator living the ultimate dream of flight without a plane. At the beginning, I didn't want to start the engines because I thought it's too dangerous and uh, tricky. He will see the Jetman. He's bringing a totally new approach to aviation, the, the, the type of aviation that we thought as kids would be readily available to all of us when we grow up. In 2011, Yves Rossi hopes to accomplish what no man has done before, a stunt that some believe rivals landing on the moon. He will fly air to air with jets. Boarding a helicopter and lifting off, Yves confident. But his fellow pilot, Jacques Bordelain, is not. We had briefed on telephone how to do things. I think it will never work. His minimum speed is 210 kilometers per hour, and my maximum speed is 220, so the margin to stay in formation is very tiny. And that's a big challenge to keep formation like that. As Jacques Bordelain and a fellow pilot make their approach, it's the moment of truth. The Jetman fires his rockets and dives. Accelerating to maximum speed, he slowly closes in. The biggest danger when you are doing formation flight is to touch the other. And especially for me, I'm a mosquito just uh, beside an eagle. And then, as they inch closer and closer together, both Yves Rossi and Jacques Bordelain realize the impossible is possible. Can you imagine, you're flying with some jets in formation and you see a man coming, joining close to you and smiling at you at six feet apart of your uh, wingtip. I know these feelings in a fighter jet, but to be like that, I had to, hey, it's real. Wow, great. It's another historic flight for Breitling and the world's only Jetman. Proving epic risks can yield epic rewards. Recognizing the environment, adapting and changing course to meet goals is essential to every aviator. It's also essential in great leaders. The right decision can mean life or death for the man or his company. 1979, 
third generation leader, Willie Breitling, is at a crossroads. His commitment to aviation has been extraordinary. It's included the creation of the Navitimer, the first wrist chronograph watch designed specifically for pilots and aviation professions. It features a circular slide rule capable of making all the necessary calculations for flight navigation. It's so important, essential, and successful that the AOPA, the world's largest association of aircraft owners and pilots, chooses the Navitimer as their official watch. Willie has also created the first wrist chronograph to travel in space. Building on the Navitimer, his remarkable cosmonaut features the same circular slide rule, but it's enhanced with a 24-hour clock. It's ideal for space travelers who need to determine when it's day and when it's night. Astronaut Scott Carpenter is the man who requested and wore the prototype of the cosmonaut while orbiting the Earth three times in the Aurora 7 capsule. In the spacecraft, it was used as a backup timer. It was a watch that I wore with great pride for a long time because of what Breitling dreamed up for the Navitimer, the slide rule dial. That made it unique. But now, in the late 70s, after so many accomplishments, Willie Breitling and his company are in trouble. The rise of the digital quartz movement has put many Swiss mechanical watchmakers out of business. An aging Willie looks for a successor who will ensure the Breitling brand continues to stand for excellence in aviation. He finds the perfect fit in pilot and watchmaker, Ernest Schneider. Ernest Schneider, he was already in the watch industry and being a pilot, an engineer, he thought that if there is a future in the watch industry, Breitling could be something very good. Schneider has experience in quartz watch design, but for Breitling, he chooses a different path. Instead of following the herd toward quartz, he takes an enormous risk, creating a mechanical watch for the elite Italian flight squadron, the Frecce Tricolori. The watch is so popular Breitling continues to improve and further develop it for decades. This bold design inspires a new watch for Breitling called the Chronomat. It marks the return of the mechanical chronograph. It becomes a bestseller and reveals Breitling to an even wider audience outside aviation circles. The Chronomat was only supposed to be a military pilot watch. That's it. It was never supposed to be marketed to the public at large, but instantly it became a success. This chronomat really was a, a key contribution to the rebirth of mechanical chronograph watches. Chronomat, it's a kind of symbol of the rebirth of Breitling in 1984. To break barriers, to break records, to succeed where others have failed and push even further despite the risks takes a relentless hunger to improve and innovate. And in aviation, whether on the wrist or in the air, Breitling is always there. 1999, Breitling and a brave team of aviators dream of doing what no man has ever done before, make the first non-stop balloon voyage around the world. You know, at Breitling, we like to partner with some of the people who live for taking risk. This was the last remaining uh, record in uh, aviation's history, and Breitling wanted to be a part of it. Though many great pilots have tried to make the epic flight and failed, Breitling's undeterred. They team up with expert pilots Bertrand Picard and Brian Jones. Their vessel, the Orbiter 3, is state-of-the-art. One of the biggest balloons ever built. It stands 180 feet tall. It's a balloon made to break records. 
but cruising at up to 30,000 feet over land and sea. No amount of cutting edge design can guarantee success or survival. To try to get a balloon to fly around the world, incredibly difficult thing to do. It's not linked to just technology. It's much more the pilot's skill with a lot of luck involved and extremely good uh, weather forecasting uh, to, to get a balloon to, to fly 26,000 miles uh, you know, and, and land where you want it to. The Orbiter 3 is built for one flight only, and the mission is extremely dangerous. I'd never flown anything this large or, or of that type before. There are no practices, there are no test balloons. The previous year, two balloons had burst because they'd gone up too quickly. And for the first few days, I know the balloon was flying us. When you're flying an airplane, you are in complete control. In a balloon, you're not. You, you simply have to accept that Mother Nature is, is, uh, is playing the role of the master. Hotel Bravo, Bravo Romeo Alpha, correction to last flight level is 190. Jones and Picard's flight plan is based on capturing the fastest winds while avoiding dangers from deadly storms and, believe it or not, attacks from below. It seems to be another danger or prohibited area. It's Oscar Yankee Papa 1-9. The jet stream's taking them directly toward a Yemeni no-fly zone. Entering this airspace could spur a sudden violent response. They shoot down all the airplanes who are coming there. And they shoot without warning. But changing course could be even more dangerous, routing them into restricted Chinese airspace. But if to avoid China, we have to be shot down by the Yemenids, it's not worthwhile because it's less kilometers. Things got a little stressful, but they were circumstances not, not of our making, not uh, of our planning. Ultimately, they take the risk and stay their course over Yemen. Morning of the 7th of March, trying to go as south as possible in order to have a better position. It was a pretty difficult time, actually, because we had some fairly brave decisions to make. This time, Mother Nature is on their side. Their brave decision has given them the added wins necessary to continue further on their course for victory. We're starting to go quick. Think that we can make it. Finally, after 19 days, 21 hours, 55 minutes, and nearly 29,000 miles, the Orbiter 3 lands on solid ground. It's the first non-stop circumnavigation of the world in a balloon, and the longest flight inside the Earth's atmosphere ever. <laughs> We've done it! <laughs> it was just the most extraordinary thing in, in my life. I would come out of the shower in the morning or something and think, I'm the first guy that flew around the world in a balloon, you know, isn't that cool? It's a moment for the record books, and it's even one of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum's milestones of flight. On the historic flight of Orbiter 3 and countless other flights by daredevils and risk takers was a watch that perhaps epitomizes Breitling's link to aviation. Ernest Schneider's landmark contribution to technology, the emergency. The early 1980s, Ernest Schneider is talking to a NATO officer. They're discussing the war years, and the soldier shares a story about parachuting out of an aircraft. I told Ernest Schneider, when I got to the ground, I was basically naked. And the only thing remaining on me was my watch. So Ernest Schneider decided that the miniaturized transmitter he was working on should be 
uh, placed into a watch. He didn't care about the size of the challenge. He went for it. Released in 1995, the Emergency Sports and Ingenious Antenna Deployment System with a micro transmitter able to broadcast an emergency signal on the international air distress frequency. Control center, we have a warning signal. That's a product nobody dared even to think about developing. It's so complicated, so challenging. This kind of transmitter usually are the size of two packs of cigarettes. Never satisfied with the past, Breitling continues to perfect the design of this watch. And now, the new Emergency 2 adds dual satellite and analog distress frequencies, along with a custom rechargeable battery. Even more peace of mind for pilots and adventurers alike. If you look at pilots, these guys were taking risks, and we had to be with them. We had to innovate to bring them the solutions that they, they need to make uh, their job uh, safer. A century of watch innovation, coupled with timeless looks, and a fierce commitment to pushing the boundaries of aviation. For Breitling, the brave spirit of pilots is the driving force behind every timepiece. Proving Breitling is the pilot's watch. The collaboration we have with the aviation is really fueling the innovation we have in our product. We develop products that push the boundaries of what's possible.